What's up, everyone? Welcome inside this Zoom chat for Citrus TV, Citrus TV men's lacrosse beat reporter Cameron McCall here. Today, my guest is Anish Shroff. You know him as ESPN's number one play-by-play -play guy for college lacrosse. He also wrote some college basketball and baseball in there. Anish, thanks for coming on. How's, uh, how's quarantine life treating you? It's been interesting. Uh, I got a lot of yard work done. We're in the throes of potty training, which uh, makes me miss the yard work, actually. Uh, we've had some decent weather up until the last few days, a lot of walks, trying to get the vitamin D when we can. And uh, so far, we're still, uh, we're still stocked on toilet paper, knock on wood. <laughs> it's got to be a surreal feeling knowing that this is the middle of prime season for you. You know, we'd be calling Syracuse versus North Carolina a couple days ago, but there's no season. You know, you go from going almost a thousand miles an hour to slamming on the brakes and a complete stop. And it probably took me a good week just to process the fact that I would not have any games to cover, wouldn't really have much work um, until August at the earliest. And mentally, you're just kind of trained March, April, May, you go into lacrosse mode. And, it's learning these teams and watching these different narratives evolve and grow and following how different teams get better in the trajectories of the season. And um, just when we were really kind of getting into it, just when conference play was about to get go in earnest, the rug sort of slipped out from beneath us. So um, it's been surreal. Uh, that's a good way of putting it. Um, and I think I'm still processing, especially now, you know, we're in mid-April. You know, in a couple more weeks, you're talking about getting close to conference championships and selection day and round one and quarterfinals. And, you know, that's the end game. And so, um, you know, the build up to that um, is definitely something I miss right now. Yeah, it, it's crazy. And, and you talk about this, this Syracuse lacrosse team, number one ranked team to end the season, 5-0, and undefeated in all their games. A lot of guys who have watched this team for a long time talked about how it felt different this year. What, what felt different about the Syracuse team to you? There was not one hole on the team. There was not really one weakness you could pinpoint if you start on the back end. Uh, to me, Drake Porter played like an All-American goalie. I mean, maybe even a first or second teamer. Defensively, you were going to get better when Nick Mellon came back. Jared Fernandez had played well. Brett Kennedy had been an All-American. They're still strong uh, in the defensive midfield with Peter Dirt. They were strong at the faceoff effects. They had the best and deepest midfield in all of Division I. And Chase Scanlon really solidified the attack, so there was no real weakness. Now, if you ask me, were they the most talented team in the country? I think they were one of the most talented teams. Virginia, Penn State on paper had more talent. But to me, this was a Syracuse team that I thought was about as close to a lock for championship weekend um, as you can be. I mean, I put them right up there with Penn State and Yale this year. Um, to me, Syracuse had all the ingredients. This was a championship weekend team. Maybe not a championship team, maybe a championship team. But without question, this was a championship weekend team. And to me, I kind of looked at this team as, hey, new decade, fresh start. If you can get to Philadelphia, if you can get back to the semifinals, all of a sudden you have a chance to kind of build back that tradition and recover the nostalgia and recover uh, sort of what was expected of the program, you know, going back 10 years when it was championship weekend or bust, not just once in a while, but every year. Exactly. And first, it was their first chance to really get the, the final four since 2013 and fans were talking potentially about the team's first title since 09 which makes it even tougher for Syracuse fans that this of all years was the year that got cut short you look at this midfield Tucker Dordovic, Brendan Curry, Jamie Tremboli they got all the attention but it was rightfully deserved all three of them All-Americans Tremboli and Curry were both first team All-Americans and Dordovic's pace was definitely better than an honorable mention over those last two games. I'll ask you, Anish, when was the last time you saw a first-line midfield that was this good in college lacrosse? Yeah, you know, I tell people all the time, you look at what Duke had when they had Miles Jones and Deemer Class. Yep. Um, you might find a couple of guys in tandem um, as good. I think you, you have to walk it back quite a bit. Maybe, you know, the teams at Virginia that had the Brattons, I mean, those were yeah. 
you know, two incredible athletes. Um, but again, to find a first midfield, I think we're all three guys were probably you know, for like for third team All-Americans. That's, that's hard to do. And um, it, it was the best first midfield Syracuse has had in, in at least 10 years. So, um, you know, I, I can't think of anybody off the top of my head. And I've been following the sport for 20 years. Um, I'm sure there might have been some Syracuse teams maybe in the early 2000s that probably, you know, had a, had a better first midfield. I mean, when I was in school, you know, you had Greg Rommel and Mike Springer and then, you know, Brian Crockett. I mean, those are, those are really good yeah. midfield. But, uh, <laughs> uh, this unit, listen, I think hands down it was the best first midfield in Division One. And when you look at their top two units, um, I thought, you know, they were one, Carolina was two in terms of uh, the best overall midfield depth in all of college lacrosse. I think that's, that's what would have made that potential matchup so exciting is just how really stacked both teams were on the offensive side of the ball because Carolina had their transfer addition in attacking Chris Gray. Syracuse also had their transfer addition, Chase Scanlon. You during the, the Hopkins game, I remember, made the D'Artagnan comment to the three Musketeers. When you look at Scanlon's season as a whole, he had 18 games, by the team in goals. If you were to give a letter grade to it, what would you give? Yeah, I'd give him an A. I mean, he, he was – every bit the number 22 that you wanted. Um, he fit that number much better than Jordan Evans did. And uh, that number had been sitting dormant. The, the player who had worn it last, um, probably unfairly was just burdened by the criticism and I think the expectations. And I think if you look in hindsight, he just wasn't the right guy for that number. Uh, Chase Scanlon, it, it seemed no sweat. I mean, it could have been 22, it could have been 45, it could have been 88, it could have been 97. I mean, it, it was, I'm going to go play lacrosse. And if you watched him at Loyola last year, he played with Pat Spencer, but he brought a creative flair. And, and, and he made it in the first round back in 2019. Uh, you played Spencer a certain way. You were going to leave Scanlon open and you put him on an island, you know, against your third pole or a shorty he'd make you pay. He's good enough to draw that first pull. And now with the midfield that Syracuse has, there's just so many conflicts of assignment for defense. Scanlon was able to take advantage. Um, I mean, this is a kid who, remember, before he even went to Loyola, played on the Iroquois national team at the World yeah. Game in Netanya. And I remember watching him, and, and they were staying at our hotel and talking to some of the coaches, and they said, no, this kid's, this kid's the real deal. And he would sit with Lyle Thompson and Miles Thompson and, you know, Tehoga and some of the other guys – uh, you know, Jeremy Thompson, and you could tell him picking their brains and, and, and kind of gauging information. So uh, not just a talented player, but a student of the game as well. Um, he's got a bright future, and he's still got a couple more years at Syracuse. Second team All-American as a freshman and led the nation in goals as a midfielder, followed it up with another, all, another All-American bid this year. For him, it was, it was almost a nonchalantness that, that made his game. Uh, he, 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 he was so smooth. Everything he did looked easy uh, when, when he was out there. And that's a quality that not a lot of people have. I, I think a lot of people associate 22 with like the, the kind of alpha dog firecracker attack, but Scanlon flipped that around, but it, it definitely still worked for him. And he proved that he's up to the number. I, I think simply by a fact of, like you said, it's, it's just the cross for him. Going there's deeper. A poetry. There's a poetry to his game, and I think you find that with a lot of Native American players, where the stick is essentially an extension of their arm. And it's more than just, you know, their tool for how they perform on the field. I mean, it is a paintbrush, and the field is their canvas. And having a chance to talk to a lot of those guys over the years and, and kind of getting to know so many of them on a closer level in Netanya, um, you know, so many of them told me that when they – they're playing a game where nobody's blowing the whistle. <laughs> there, there's no whistles for withholding <laughs> or holding. Um, there's no flags. There's no penalties. And when these kids are, you know, 12, 13 years old, they're playing pickup games on the reservation with guys who are grown men in their 20s, in their 30s. And you're forced to improvise. And there's only so much you can get out of cone drills. And these guys play. And so in the flow of an actual game, they're trying to figure things out as they go along. And then that becomes second nature and it becomes habit. And you get to see that out on the field. And, and Scanlon, you know, is, is kind of from that lineage. You saw it with Zed Williams. Uh, you yeah. saw it with Denver and Zach Miller. You saw it with 
uh, Nanakoke. You certainly saw it with the Thompsons, and there's a number of others that come through Syracuse, the Bucktooth. So there, there is that poetry to the game, and a lot of that is from playing pickup. Um, yeah. playing against guys who are older than you, where you are making it up as you go along, and every couple of games you play, all of a sudden, you know, I'm going to do that. I'm going to try to do that. And they're pulling off moves in games, and that's why it looks so easy. Mm-hmm. It's almost like pickup basketball and how that culture has influenced a lot of players. Going a little deeper into the Syracuse team, looking at – looking at maybe an under-the-radar player. They had nine All-Americans, but there were a lot of under-the-radar contributors that wound up really being important for this team. Who, who is your under-the-radar MVP for this Syracuse team this year? You know, there's a few. I think Peter Durth has gotten to the point now where he's become so under-the-radar, he's no longer underrated. Um, but I, I think Durth is probably one of the top two or three d middies in the country. I mean, he's almost as good as Tara Fenko. In fact, uh, he doesn't turn it over as much. So Peter Durth is a guy who I thought last year was criminally underrated. Started to get more pub this year, but he was such a big part of their transition game. And I know he got hurt, you know, late in the season or late in what was left of the season. Uh, <laughs> I thought Brett Kennedy, the way he made the transition from LSM to close defense – um, he was getting better and better with every game. I thought Jared Fernandez, Andrew Helmer, I mean, those guys in the middle of the field um, made the transition game go. Drake Porter in goal was so good stopping shots from inside 10 yards, um, as good as I've seen in the last four or five years. And, and he could uh, – I thought he single-handedly won them the Army game. So, um, you know, and probably I think offensively, Jamie Tromboli, I always felt that he was the forgotten man. Everyone focused on – you know, the complete package that Dordovic was and the speed of Curry. Tromboli was a guy who, over the course of his career, came through in the clutch time and time and time again. Great shooter, um, a big-time performer, fourth-quarter player. Uh, to me, he, he was probably one of the top three midfielders, and he was their best midfielder this year. Four, four All-Americans for under-the-radar guys. But it, 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 it does go that way with Syracuse sometimes, and I think you saw – a lot of the under the radar pieces fit together like that. I just thought the entire defensive unit, uh, there, there were a lot of concerns people had about the defensive unit and those only got amplified when Nick Mellon got down, but one through six, that unit was, was deep enough and had enough quality, whether it was Brandon Avila coming in as a freshman, as that second, that, that top shorty pair or uh, Nick DiPietro and Graham Murphy filling in on close. The reason that team worked defensively is because it was so deep. Uh, yeah, I would have a hard time putting too much praise on the defense just because I don't think they were tested. Um, you look at who they had played. The Army game really Porter bailed them out. I didn't think they played yeah. all well. They were bailed out by a sublime performance by Porter. And then the rest of the schedule, you know, Hobart, um, again, solid team, but a flawed team. Uh, Colgate. Um, Johns Hopkins this year, I mean, Joey Epstein yeah. wasn't even close to himself. No. And, and you could tell it's that. really easy to game plan Hopkins. So I, I really wanted to see Syracuse get tested. And, and that, that is kind of, you know, I didn't rank them number one in the final poll just because I saw more from Cornell against opponents that were just on a higher plane. Cornell beating Penn State in a neutral site game to me was huge. Um, and so, again, I think Syracuse, as you said, the pieces were all there. Uh, defensively, they were getting better. But, okay, can that defense work against Virginia? Can it work against Notre Dame? Can it work against North Carolina? We never got to see that. Yeah, and that's the knock, right? Because I, for Syracuse in general is that they never played a complete enough opponent. And that's why I think they won a lot of their games because Army was a very defensive first team that struggled on offense. Hobart, one of the better offensive teams in the country, even if it was against more inferior opposition, but they couldn't keep up with Syracuse's scoring. Count that for Binghamton and Colgate and, and Johns Hopkins. 